we have to go through these things, but they'll be brief. Um, BASIC um, has been off, you know, he's been on the Continental Tour. It's what happens when you get sent down, you know, from some school in England. Your parents send you off on the Continental Tour. Uh, at any rate, he, when he went on the Continental Tour, he was, the English would see it as, I'm sure, being sent up. And uh, he was sent up to Oxford, where he got his doctorate. And uh, while he was there, he, he was personally tutored by perhaps my favorite theologian, a man by the name of Macquarie, uh, whom I think is a wonderful theologian. And, uh, and then, as though that were not enough to study directly under one of the world's great theologians, he went off to uh, Germany or somewhere, where they think they have theologians as well, and he studied personally again under Karl Rahner. The only thing I hold against Basic is that he likes Runner better than he likes Macquarie, and I don't understand that. But then I'm an Anglican, you see. <laughs> so at any rate, um, he has, as you all know, great skill and ability to put together the kinds of things that are going on with people's lives and wire those together with, uh, with a very comprehensive understanding of the Christian faith. And with that, uh, I give you Father... James Basic. Uh, we are taping this uh, today, and I am talking exactly 29 minutes. And our uh, Dick Adler here will probably reset the machine or something, or uh, help me to accomplish all of this on time. I hope all of this, rest of this uh, stuff that Terry had to say is getting erased <laughs> from the tape, <laughs> we hope. And so, Dick, what I'm going to do in a minute or so here is, first I say I'm happy to be here and to uh, be doing this again. It's become sort of a tradition. I enjoy it, and uh, I'm looking uh, forward to this whole series. And as soon as we're all set up then, I am going to ask Dick to, when I actually start, <laughs> you're supposed to tell me when 29 minutes are up, okay? <laughs> well, I want to welcome uh, all of you to this uh, series that, of talks on uh, the topic of conversion. I think sometimes people hear that word conversion and they get put off. They think of people being knocked off of their horse or strong striking experiences of a religious nature that uh, seem to be foreign. But I want to use this topic of conversation to help us to explore something about our own lives, uh, to look more deeply at who we are and where we fit. I see it as a way of systematically analyzing our own progress in the spiritual life. You know, spirituality is important to us. Uh, spirituality has to do with becoming more fully human, with being in touch with the deepest sources of our energy and strength, of tapping uh, into the spirit that resides in the very center of our being. And my feeling is that uh, if we are going to grow as human beings, become better Christians, more mature people, we often have to work at it rather carefully and systematically. So all the things that I'm going to say about the question of conversion have to do with helping us to do that in a, a really better fashion. Now, there's a couple things we should keep in mind, I think, about ourselves to begin with, and that is we are developmental creatures. We are in process. We are making ourselves to be what we will be forever. The process of growth doesn't end at age 21, and the real model of what it means to be a Christian is not a little girl in a white dress making her first communion. What we are after is an adult Christianity. We're, at, we're trying to see ourselves as in process, as always having the chance to do a little bit better. A lot of times people come to me and say, well, you know, do you think there's any hope for me, or can I do any better, or am I just stuck here? And I know my intuitive response is always, yeah, I think you can do better. I think that's possible. I think conversion is possible. It's possible for us to turn it around, to get hold of our lives, to do better. And that's one of the premises that's involved in all of this, that we are evolutionary creatures. 
in our personal lives. We are growing and developing, and we have opportunities to do that carefully and intelligently. The other premise involved in this whole series of talks is that uh, we are multi-dimensional creatures. That is, we uh, function in various ways. There are various aspects of our personality. So we are people who can get angry when things go wrong and feel pride when we are able to accomplish things in our lives. That suggests to us that we are emotional creatures. We have an affective life as an important domain of um, what it means to be human. We are affective <coughs> creatures. We can also imagine getting a better job or spring coming or our family life going better or uh, disasters impending. We have the ability to foresee, to imagine. And so I would, I would say again that part of the dimension of our existence, one aspect of it is we are imaginative creatures and we need to make imaginative types of conversions. We're people who think, we analyze problems, you know, we figure out solutions, we use our reason, we have logic. And so it is that we are intellectual creatures. That's part of what it means to be human. And again, we are called to make at times intellectual conversions. We're also the kind of people who can do a better job of getting along with people. We can decide to be more sensitive. We can decide to get involved in social justice projects. We can decide to get rid of one of our vices in life. That suggests that we are moral creatures. Morality is an aspect of our existence and we can make moral conversions. We're also the people who can wrestle with the great problems of life can think about the great questions of meaning and purpose. We're the people who can drop down on our knees at night and say, thank you, Lord, for the day. We're the people who can be walking along and looking up into the sky and thinking about the vastness of this cosmos of ours. We are people who can hear a call from beyond echoing in our own hearts and conscience. We are, in short, religious creatures. Religion is an aspect of our existence, and we can be involved in religious conversions as well. So, the premise of this whole series of talks, therefore, is that we people who are, have the opportunity to grow and develop do so according to various aspects, all of which can be improved. And so we are going to be talking about affective conversion, an imaginative conversion, intellectual conversions, moral conversions, and finally, religious conversions. Now, I want to uh, turn right here to this, the first one that we want to talk about, and that is uh, the affective type of conversion. I want to begin uh, by telling about a gentleman who told me I could share his uh, story with you. I always uh, disguise my stories a bit. I mean, people understand that, I think. But this gentleman said that he didn't really care. We'll call him Bill. And Bill ended up in my office because his wife sent him there. And um, <clears throat> his wife was not happy with uh, the whole thing that was going on in their life. She was not happy with their communication. She felt that somehow he had sort of died inside of himself. Uh, she was uh, not at all pleased with uh, the way he was relating to his children, his teenage son as a, one good example, and his, uh, the younger daughters as well. So Ken uh, ends up, uh, I mean, uh, Bill ends up in my office, and um, we begin to talk about uh, all of this, and he describes for me uh, his life, the way it's going on, and he tells me that he's, he's just sort of blocked, that uh, he doesn't have a whole lot of feeling going on in his life. Um, he finds it hard to be in touch with his emotions. He finds it very difficult to say anything to his wife, really, about how he feels about her. It is difficult for him to even hug his daughters. Uh, he feels uh, strange about that. He had a horrible time trying to explain sexuality to his 
teenage son. That was one of the great traumas of his life. He just couldn't bring himself to really uh, talk in an open fashion with his son. He once told me that uh, when he was at Mass, as a Catholic gentleman, and it was time for the greeting of peace, that he really um, could not kiss his wife there in the church scene. Uh, he just felt terribly awkward about doing that. He couldn't really tell her, even in their more intimate moments, that he loved her, that it was just sort of beyond him. And so we began to explore all of this. I made a number of suggestions uh, to Bill. I suggested that he was uh, going to have to try to get in touch with his feelings going to have to learn more about what's going on inside of him, his sentiments, his emotions. He had to get in touch with that. He had to understand it. I wanted him to become very attentive to what was happening in his inner life. In fact, I put him on sort of a regimen of trying to write down a whole lot of things that were happening with him. <clears throat> We even got very programmatic about it. Uh, um, it was uh, very artificial in some senses. Uh, I wanted him to call his wife from the office uh, each day and to try to say something nice to her, something uh, about their relationship or what was going on. Uh, not a business matter, but just something that um, was uh, more endearing and of a more intimate character. I wanted him to force himself to begin to talk, first of all, with his daughters, uh, to uh, set aside a period of time when he would uh, really sit down with them and uh, discuss and try to understand what, what was going on with them. I suggested that their prayer time together at Mass was really important to them, and he should be attentive to what he was feeling when he was there with the family. Well, I, I, we often uh, kidded about all of this, and we all said that the, the, that the therapy would be complete, probably, on the occasion when he would be in church and during the greeting of peace would really uh, very spontaneously and with warmth reach over, give his wife a hug, and kiss her in church. And I guess uh, one of my better days occurred when he reported to me that is indeed what he was able to do. Now, I see uh, my friend Bill in all of this as uh, being an example of a person who has undergone an affective conversion. To undergo an affective conversion means that one moves or swings, does a 180, turns it around in one way or another. To be unconverted and affectively means that we repress our emotions, um, that we're not even aware of what we feel, just sort of out of touch with all of that, that we're maybe even uninterested in what we feel. We are logical, cerebral people and don't really care what our emotions are all about. No, we're the, to be unconverted means that we are the prey to demons, that there's things in our unconscious that come forward to strike us, and we're in strange moods that we don't understand, that we're not able to handle things as they come up, that many of our emotions seem inappropriate, uh, out of sync. To be in unconverted state means that we are subject to self-deception, that we have little guidance with, uh, to know what to do about what is wrong in our lives so that if we get depressed, we have no sense of how we might try to come out of all of that. We have an inability to understand the deepest sources of our joys and anxieties in life, subject to mysterious mood swings that uh, we can't do anything about. In general, in this state, we feel that we are a victim of our emotions. That's something of what I would mean to say we are unconverted emotionally. And that's to draw a stark picture. I mean, no one's going to say, you know, I'm totally unconverted emotionally. But that is to draw the polarity. Now, if one is converted emotionally, then things begin to change. Now, we are in a position where we know what we feel. We're in touch with our emotions. Oh, they're no longer repressed, but they come to the surface. We're able to experience them. 
we're able to understand something, maybe not totally, but we understand something of why we feel that way and what it means to us. We've learned to accept our emotions. Well, we're able to say if we have weird fantasies that, well, that's me. Or if I'm jealous of someone, that there's no reason to be jealous of them, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm not going to get bent out of shape because I experience this envy or jealousy. That's just part of being human. So I've learned, in a sense, to accept my emotions. But I'm also able, to, in a converted state, to critique my emotions, to make judgments about them. I'm able to say sometimes, well, it's inappropriate to be angry here. That was a minor slight, and I've been angry for three days. Been in a blue funk because someone didn't say hello to me. That's inappropriate. So I'm able to make judgments about my emotions. And I'm able to do something about getting my emotions more in sync with reality and with what my insights tell me about life. My emotions are then able to be mobilized for my good, that they work for me now. They, are a, they move me to more constructive action. They are uh, integrated into my total psyche. My intelligence is able to uh, use them in order to achieve growth in my life, to get along better with other people, to make a contribution to what is going on in the world. So that is, uh, you say that to describe the situation. Those are polarities, the two extremes of being unconverted, totally out of touch, on the other hand, being in touch, understanding and mobilizing my emotions in order that I can live a more constructive life. I think we need to, to look more closely at these feelings and what they are all about because they are our important inner experiences. You know, they give us our initial response to life. I'm trying to point out now how important our emotions are. This is like what we would say uh, to Bill when he first comes in to me and says, well, I'm not interested in all this. You know, I'm a businessman. I got things to do and so on. And here my wife wants me in to be in touch with all this feeling level. You know, well, that sounds weird to me. So first thing I got to do is to tell Bill that this is important. I mean, our feelings uh, are an essential part of who we are as human beings. They give us our initial sense of life. You know, we meet a good person, and, it, it just, it, and we're attracted to them. And then we want to talk more to, to them. Maybe we want to get to know them better. Our, our feelings are what move us in that direction. Then maybe good things happen. Oh boy, a new vista is opened up to me because I've met a new friend. My intelligence didn't tell me that. No, it is my feelings that put me in touch with this sense that there's a good person here. Good vibrations are coming for them. I could learn something for them or learn something about what the virtuous life is all about. Further, our emotions are valuable to us because they help focus our thinking and our acting. They often galvanize us uh, to uh, get into action, move us to do good things. For example, there's some people who have a strong fear and revulsion of the, about the nuclear holocaust, the possibility that we could destroy ourselves. There's some people fearful of that and just very distressed with this uh, ominous threat that hangs over the human race right now. Well, some people, instead of uh, just uh, pulling the covers over their head at that point and saying, I'm anxious and fearful, use the, that emotion in order to get into action, to become a peacemaker, to work for justice in the world, oh, to try to do something constructive to avert this threat. So what has happened is, for many people, this fear of the nuclear holocaust has kept them in action over the years to work for peace, even though there doesn't seem to be much progress or we're not getting any place with all of that. Our emotions work for us. They give us the zest for life. They're part of the chemistry that keeps us going. They're the things that can lift us up. They're also the, the elements in our psyche that often pull us down and that we need to deal with. But the emotions are terribly important, and uh, we need to see that as a first step.
as I spent a lot of time with Bill trying to get him to see that he was an emotional creature and that if he got more in touch with his emotions and could manage them better, that he was going to be a more effective human being. He's going to be a better father to his daughter. He's going to get along better with his wife. He might even be able to talk better with his son someday. All of that if he would work along this line. Now, I tried to give Bill a, a good deal of advice, and I think you could take the kind of advice that I give along this line and divide it into two things. One is we need to gain insight into our emotions, and two, we need to learn how to express them constructively. Two things that I believe are involved in becoming a converted person emotionally. I told uh, Bill that I thought it was important for him to be very honest about his feelings, that he would not fake anything with his wife. He wouldn't pretend that he felt more than uh, he really did. He had to be honest. If he was not uh, getting along well, if there was something wrong, uh, he should say it. If he was angry, he should get that out. If um, other things, if he was feeling joyful and happy, he should try to express it. No dishonesty. And because he was so out of touch, he had to find his way, really, to, to make all of this work. I suggested to him that it was uh, very important that he feel new emotions at any given point and not remembered ones. Well, one of the problems with uh, emotions is that we often, at the very beginning, think we know what we feel, and it is in a given situation where we really don't feel that at all. I notice that in giving, getting up and giving talk. Now, I might feel tension now in my neck and shoulders, even though I'm not terribly nervous at this moment. No, but it's like a remembered response uh, from other occasions when I would be giving talk. And it seems important to be able to distinguish that out, to be in touch with the emotion one is really feeling at any given moment. And also, I told Bill it was important for him to feel uh, what was he really felt and not what he was supposed to feel. It was his wife wanted him uh, to be a lot more emotionally involved in their lovemaking. You know, and it became a question again of not just uh, trying to feel that way because she wanted that, but to see what would really happen to him when he was relating to her in some sort of honest an open way. So you see a lot of ways, and I'm trying to tell him in other words, there's a lot of ways in which uh, one would fail to get in touch with emotions or what we're really feeling at a given moment. Now I wanted him to try to describe his emotions precisely. Have you ever notice how, uh, this kind of thing like you wake up in the morning and you feel vaguely bad? And um, at least uh, some people have this power. If you can then f uh, pinpoint what it is bad you feel, I'm sad or anxious, if you can name that and then have some sense of what's causing it, sometimes that emotion will dissipate, just like that. <laughs> Negative emotions often will go away simply by naming them and simply understanding their cause. And especially it becomes important to get the precise name for these negative emotions, I think. Well, the same thing goes for the positive as well. Now, let's, um, I want to go through with um, the way I tried to get Bill look, to look systematically at his emotions. And um, what we see here is that I want him to, to, to look at how he's reacting to the people in his family. I want him to see if he likes what he sees there or whether he dislikes it, first of all. Just at that elemental level, when he's interacting with them, does he like the interactions or he doesn't? Does he really love his wife or has that died in some way? Then, I want him to, as he begins to look at this, I want to see when he has a real desire to be with them and when he has an aversion to that. I want him to be very precise about the moments when he really would like to be around them and to talk to them and so on, and when he would want to be by himself and apart, and I want him to say that honestly to all the members of his family. 
I want him then to be in touch with the joys and the disappointments and the sadness that are involved in those relationships. What, when he's interacting, what really makes him feel joyful? That's a result of what would be going on. And what part of that does he feel sad about? And then I want him to be in touch with anxiety or peacefulness. I want inner peacefulness, I would call it. I want him to, to know when something seems is askew with his world, when he doesn't feel as though he fits in any of that. In the same token, I want him to, be, to know when he feels like he belongs, when he's comfortable with the setting, when he knows an inner peace. All of those emotions are what happens as we interact directly with other people. But there's a whole other range of emotions I want him to think about. And these are the emotions that are involved in dealing with obstacles to our relationships. So I want him to, to deal with hope or despair. I want him right away to have hope that he can overcome his situation. I want to know if he feels despair, like I can't be any better, you know. I blocked all my emotions for so long, they don't work anymore. Or can he have hope and say, I can be converted in this uh, affective way? I want him to deal with the pairs of courage or fear. I want him to say, why is it you can't talk to your teenage son about sexuality? Why is it you cannot hug your daughters? I want him to unpack that fear. And I want him to act courageously, sort of almost forcing himself to act courageously and to talk to his daughters even when he finds that to be very difficult. And then I want him to deal with anger and something that I might call peacefulness as well, or repose. It is when things are not going well and he feels blocked and harm has come into his life, I want him to know that emotion and also want him to feel that uh, repose in uh, a satisfying relationship. So all of those uh, could be used, you see, as a way of delineating more carefully what it means to be an emotional person, to name the emotions precisely. You notice, I mean, there's a very different things. Love and joy are not the same thing. No, desire is different from uh, hope that we would have. To name the emotions precisely is part of our way of knowing what we're good at and the other things that we need to work on. There's so another a thing that I would like uh, Bill to be in touch with and that is to distinguish repression from suppression. To distinguish repression from a healthy expression of feelings. A lot of what he was involved with was repression. So he found that every time his wife even invited him to do something or suggested that he do something, he found himself getting angry and upset. <coughs> angry and upset because of that, uh, well, it didn't make sense. He said to me, he says, I don't know why that bugs me. She just asked if I wanted to go to the party and I sort of felt like she really wanted to go and it makes me terribly angry. Well, what we found out in the long run was that uh, Bill grew up in a family where his mother was really pushy, kept uh, demanding things from him all the time. And uh, what he had done was sort of detach that emotion of anger over that from his mother and put it upon his wife. Uh, she was not a pushy person at all. I happen to know her also. And, uh, but that's how he felt angry so part of his conversion process was to realize he's really angry at his mother and to quit displacing that upon his wife that's an example of getting over repression on the other hand what I want him to be in touch with is the positive possibilities of suppressing emotions to use some of the classical terminology that is that it's not always a matter of just saying everything we feel Sometimes he would be upset with his wife and it would be a lot more prudent not to tell her. Oh, that things would just go more smoothly. So what he has to do is to learn to use his intelligence and insight to say, when does it make sense to express what I feel and when should I hold it in? Now that's all the difference in the world in having emotions that are in our unconscious and we have repressed and we don't know about and they jump out and make a snap at somebody or make us sad when there's no reason to be sad. 
When I know what I'm doing, it's all the difference in the world. I'm angry at you right now, but I'm not going to say anything because it's not going to be constructive, and I'll get over it before long, and things will just go a lot more smoothly if I keep my mouth shut. So I think this distinction here between repression and suppression helps a lot in this conversion process. Now in all of this, I think it's important to realize there is a religious dimension you know, as I've been talking along, one could say, well, you know, what's that got to do with what I usually think of as religious conversion or the spiritual life? Well, first of all, it has everything to do with the spiritual life because we try to come closer to God and live out our commitment to Christ as a total human being. We don't do so just as an intellect or a head. We do that trying to put our head and our heart together. We're trying to respond as total persons to the call of God to become our better selves. So, of course, there's already a spiritual dimension built into all of that. But there's also explicit religious things we need to keep in mind. That is, one of the reasons we can face our emotions is because we believe in a God who knows us, calls us by name, holds us in the palm of her hand, watches over us always. A God who knows the dark forces within us. We can't hide our envies and jealousies and hatreds and angers and all the emotion, uh, negative emotions. It's already known, and God accepts us as we are with all of those dark forces. And that's a, a marvelous thing to know. That's the deepest reason why we can face these things. It might be hard to tell it to somebody else, although that, we might have to get around to that but we can face it because God already loves us. And as Christian people, we finally uh, look to see the model and example of Jesus. And I see him as one who is able to mobilize his emotions in order to be a constructive force for good in the world. So we think of uh, when he cried, when uh, Lazarus died, felt genuine sadness over the death of uh, his friend, and that mobilized him to be compassionate uh, to Lazarus' family. No, it helped him uh, then.